Looks like we finally got some snow. That's really nice. Hopefully, hopefully it sticks around. Um, boo. Now that, wait, Christmas is last week. Oh, yeah. So get this out of here. So, um, But, yeah, such a cool thing to be a part of that. Sam and Olivia, um, just want to commend you guys. And it goes, it goes for us all that um, the things that are worth it are not always the easy things. Like raising children. Um, the things that are worth it require a commitment, a dedication. You have to set your heart, the Bible talks about. And what we're going to talk about today is how someone set his heart, resolved in his heart to give God the glory and not himself and not the culture and not false gods. You know, it's the new year. 2024 is like a few hours away, basically. Um, And it's just around the corner, and you know what that means? This is my favorite part where you fill in the blank and I get to hear hear what you're thinking. But anyways, what I was going to say is uh, New Year's resolutions. You hear New Year's resolutions? Just like Sam and Olivia, it's not a New Year's resolution, but you are resolving to honor God in the way that you raised John Henry. You're setting in your heart, you're setting the course for the rest of your life as parents for the rest of his life as your son. And that's a good thing, to resolve in your heart. New Year's resolutions, you know, I saw a list online, 60 New Year's resolutions to start 2024 off right. It's like, it's too much. (laughs) It's too much. Um, And I've never really been a New Year's resolution person, but I think it's important to have goals. Goals are important so you can set your direction. Oftentimes, your your time, your energy, your efforts will be aimless if you don't set a course, right? And actually, last year, we started 2023 with a sermon series called Setting the Course. You know, if you set the destination before you begin, you will most likely arrive there. And that seems goofy to say, but some of us are wandering through life aimless, purposeless, because we've never set the course. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. You know, whether it's goals or resolutions, there's an endless amount of things we should do or want to be doing, right? I think one person nodded their head, right? Are we awake? Right? I mean, think about the stereotypical things. I'm going to start going to the gym. I'm going to eat healthier. I'm going to read more. I'm going to kick a bad habit. I'm going to start a good habit, you know, whatever it is. And the stereotypical resolutions have much to do with our own self-improvement or benefit. It's what I should do. What do I want? How could I accomplish? And there's nothing really inherently wrong with that unless that's what you're living for, right? Today, however, I want to talk about a different kind of resolution. That's the title of my message. A different kind of resolution where we're going to be in Daniel chapter 1. And we'll go through our own series next month for the 21-day fast and starting off the year. But this is my plea to you. This is my exhortation as your pastor. That if we are going to be a people of God in our culture in 2024, if we are going to be the light of the world, shining the hope and light of Christ, we need to have a different kind of resolution. That's not going to deal with going to the gym and eating healthier, although those, those things are good. You should probably do those things. Daniel made a resolution not for his own benefit of what he should be doing or wants to do or what he wants to accomplish, but for the honor and glory of God. And he sets an amazing example of which we can learn greatly from as we enter this next coming year. And I think, just like Paul said, it's like you need to pick up your mat. You need to look backwards if you're going to move forward. 
You know, those who forget history are doomed to repeat it. The entire book of Judges is about those who forgot their past and they were doomed to repeat it. Over and over and over they repeated it, and it was a tragedy. I mean, the book of Judges is how God raised up judges. But what you could also call that book, without any exaggeration, is the book of cyclical failure. Because it doesn't even end on a good note. It ends with an even more horrific, tragic story of yet another failure. And when we forget where we came from, and when we forget to put first things first, we will inevitably not arrive where we want to be. Right? So as we close this year, I want to challenge you, I want to encourage you, I want to exhort you, and I'll let the Holy Spirit rebuke you if needed, because this next year is going to be wonderful. You know why? Because Jesus is on the throne. And everything auxiliary that could happen along with that is just icing on the cake. And even if next year is a challenge, Jesus is on the throne. Amen? And until we see him coming on the clouds face to face and are caught up with him, he's going to still be on the throne until we see him face to face. So... I don't usually do this, but for the sake of context, I actually want to read Daniel chapter 1. And I I don't usually read that much scripture, because that's a lot, but I think it's important given our topic for today. So Daniel chapter 1, it's right after um, Ezekiel in the Bible. Daniel chapter 1, verse 1, and I'm reading in the NIV today. When you got it, say, I got it. Awesome. And let me just say this. This is when, especially when we're going through an entire chapter, this is why I would encourage you to have your Bible with you. Because it'll be on the screen, but then it'll be off the screen. And if you have your Bible in your lap or in your hands or on your phone or whatever, however form you have it, I like paper, um, You can see the whole chapter, and you can skip around, even if it's not on the screen. So, Daniel chapter 1, it says, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. These he carried off to the temple of his God in Babylonia and put in the treasure house of his God. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, chief of court officials, to bring into the king's service some uh, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility, young men without physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them language and literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them daily amount, a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years, and after that they were to enter the king's service. Among those who were chosen were some, of, some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The chief officials gave them new names. To Daniel, the name Belteshazzar, Belteshazzar. To Hananiah, Shadrach. To Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine, and he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself this way. Now God had caused the official to show favor and compassion to Daniel, but the official told Daniel, I am afraid of my lord the king who has assigned your food and drink. Why should he see you looking worse than the other young men of your age? The king would have my head because of you. Daniel then said to the guard, whom the chief official had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, please test your servant for ten days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then compare our appearance with, the, uh, with that of the young men who eat the royal food and treat your servants in accordance with what you see. 
So he agreed to this and tested them for 10 days. At the end of the 10 days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. So the guard took away their choice food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables instead. To these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning, and Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. At the end of the time set by the king to bring them into his service, the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them, and he found none equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the king's service. In every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom. And Daniel remained there until the first year of King Cyrus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we know that you know all things. God, you know what this next year has in store. And you know all of the plans that you have for us. Lord, I pray that you would help us to serve you first. God, I pray that you would help us to look to you first. Lord, I pray that you would help us to fix our eyes on the things above, where Christ is seated at the place of honor next to the Father. Lord, we thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your faithful leadership and shepherding in our lives. Lord, we thank you that you know how to course correct us and call us back to your heart. Lord, we ask for your mercy and your favor, Lord, to walk faithfully and obediently to you, with you, during this next coming year. Help us to resolve in our heart, like Daniel did, to give you the glory. In Jesus' name, everyone said, amen. So just to quick summarize, Judah, to give you some backstory to the book of Daniel, Judah sinned. You can read, I mean, the, um, uh, the Chronicles, First and Second Chronicles, the, King, the book of the kings. Um, Judah sinned, and God raised up Babylon, the nation of Babylon, to judge them and take them away into exile for a period of time. So Babylon is actually being used by God as judgment towards the nation of Judah. And now we have this unique situation where Daniel and his friends are faithful Israelites in the land of Babylon, and they are being trained for service to the king. Um, everybody tracking? Everybody tracking? So here's something you need to understand, however, before we get in to our message today is Babylon is a superpower. And it most likely was the superpower. Um, there was no kingdom like Babylon. I mean, in that, in that time. And um, it was a wicked kingdom. It was a wicked nation. In fact, all throughout Scripture, and this is why we need, you know, Folks, I just want to challenge you as, as your pastor. We need to go into this next year knowing the Word of God. 2 Timothy 2.15 says that we're to rightly divide the Word of God. That we should study to seek the Lord, to show ourselves approved, rightly dividing the Word of God. That doesn't just mean that we should know it, which we should. It means that we should be able to understand it and know how to share it with others. Right? Right? And we are entering such an age where quite, and I'm not, I don't want to freak you out or anything, but there's a, you know, Sam and Olivia have to be responsible for John Henry. They have made a commitment to raise him in the fear and admonition of the Lord and to raise him so that he, you know, by God's grace, serves the Lord and is a beneficial member of society, Right? So as parents, they have a responsibility, and we as the body of Christ have a responsibility when it comes to matters of truth, because Jesus is the truth. And so when it comes to the Word of God, which is the truth, um, we have a responsibility to know it and divide it and explain it to others. And this next year is going to be, um, you know, just with, with where our culture is at, 
It's, people are so easily deceived by all kinds of things. Um, and especially uh, with where some things are trending. Uh, you know, Google knows more about the Word of God than most of us sitting in this room. You know? So it doesn't, just because you can type something in Google doesn't mean you're a scholar. Right? And just because you have a YouTube channel doesn't mean you're a teacher. And just because you have a podcast doesn't mean you're a pastor. Right? And this isn't to create some kind of weird hierarchy of people. Because Ephesians chapter 4 says we are the body of Christ and we are equipped for the work of the ministry. Right? That, that the world will know that we're his disciples by the way we love each other and by the way we represent the, the truth, salt and light of the earth. So we're all on the team. Amen? Let me just say that again. We are all on the team. Nobody's on the bench, right? But it means that you're on the team. <laughs> it means you're on the field. And we don't want to get blindsided because we're unprepared, right? So read your Bible. So back to Babylon. Babylon, all throughout Scripture, from Genesis to Revelation, Babel, Babylon, it's the same, same word, Greek or Hebrew, it's presented as basically the opposite kind of kingdom that God is desiring to build. Let me say that again. Babylon is the opposite kind of kingdom that God desires to build. It's like the anti-Jerusalem. It's the anti-kingdom. Babylon, all throughout Scripture, from Genesis to Revelation, it's what the spirit of Antichrist is, by the way. You know, a lot of people are looking for a man as, as times get turbulent. But really, there, the Bible talks about how there will be many antichrists because it's a spirit. It's a spiritual matter. And all it means, you know, it's not freaky. It's not to scare you. It's, it's, all it means is it's the opposite and substitute of what Jesus came to build through his kingdom, through his death, burial, and resurrection. Now let me say that again. The spirit of Antichrist is just the opposite and substitute of what Jesus came to build. Everybody tracking? And Babylon is that. It's not up there, but Genesis chapter 11 says the people of Babel made a tower stretching to the, he to the heavens because they wanted to make a name for themselves. They wanted to make a name for themselves. And so, rather than commune with God to have access to heaven, they made a tower. They were never going to reach it, but they took it into their own hands. Isaiah 14, 13 through 15, it's up there. It says, but you said in your heart, this is the king of Babylon saying this, but you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God, and I will sit on the mount of the assembly in the recesses of the north. I will ascend above all the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. You know, that is a proof text for the character of Satan. And that's the king of Babylon. You know, Isaiah 14. And then you see in Revelation, verse after verse, talking about Babylon uh, is is referenced to as a harlot who makes the, leads the nations away from God and makes them drink the wine of her passions and immorality. Have you noticed some immorality in the world? So this is a spiritual reality because it's a spiritual enemy, Right? It's a spiritual reality because it's a spiritual enemy. Ephesians talks about how we don't fight against flesh and blood. We're, our, our enemy isn't people, uh, but it's a spiritual reality because it's a spiritual fight. And this is why the... So now that we have the backstory of the significance of... Ba this is where Daniel is, by the way. This is his new home, right? How would you like to live there? We kind of are. Um, <laughs> This is why Daniel's example is so important. And it speaks to us so clearly today because Daniel gives us an example of how we can honor God. 
We are in this world, the Bible says, but we're not of it, Jesus said. We need to make up our mind and determine in our heart who we are going to serve, right? So I would look to, like to look quickly look at three ways Daniel's example can teach us for this coming year. Okay? Number one, resolve to put the Lord first. If we're talking New Year's resolution, we're talking about a different kind of resolution, and we need to resolve to put the Lord first. Verse 8 says, Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. He asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself in this way. And you know what? This is not just talking about dietary preference. Daniel was a good Israelite who made a distinction between, between clean and unclean food. But this is not just talking about whether the king was serving pork or shellfish. Right? And in fact... What is going on is that the food that was being offered to him, if you look at verse 5, it's not up there, but the food that was being offered him was the king's rations. It was the king's rations. And this was the best food. You had to understand that the food for Nebuchadnezzar was the best food. It was food that almost certainly was food that would have already had been it would have already been offered to idols and other gods in the temple in their temple so this food the king's food and his wine would have been used for the worship of false gods and the worship of idols so to partake in that food would be for Daniel to defile himself and actually take part in honoring the gods of, of, of Babylon. So it wasn't just pork. It wasn't just staying clean. It was, I will not defile myself by taking part in worshiping your false gods. See how that applies to us today? Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself and he would not worship those gods. It was an act of worship and devotion because God is the only one worthy of worship. The Bible says that God is a jealous God, meaning that he, he jealously desires our worship. Not that he's insecure, but that he's the maker of the universe. That when we bow to false gods, we might as well bow to a log or a hunk of rock. You know, the book of Isaiah talks about. The praise of the whole world belongs to the Lord. Amen? So we have to resolve to put the Lord first. Resolve to live this way. In this coming year, Resolve to put the Lord first. Where does your time, your talent, your treasure go? What are you investing in? You know, we don't keep check registers anymore. But if someone looked at your bank account, what are you investing in? If someone looked at your time clock for life, what are you investing in? And I don't want to heap condemnation on you, but you know what? At the end of the year, it's a good time to hold up the mirror. Right? So we can set the course as we move forward. Right? Does it reflect a devotion to God? If we say we seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, does our time and talent and treasure reflect that? We can all grow. Amen? Exodus 20, verse 2 and 3, the first of the Ten Commandments. It says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You know, the first commandment makes it pretty clear that there's no Jesus plus. And did you know 
this is kind of funny, funny. You know why the you know why the Christians were persecuted in Rome? They were atheists. Let that sink in for a second. Christians were persecuted in Rome because they were considered atheists. Because they didn't worship the God soup that the culture was distributing. Because there was one man, one name, in heaven and on earth by which we can be saved. And his name is Jesus. They were considered atheists. They wouldn't recognize Caesar as a demigod. They wouldn't worship Zeus or Artemis. They wouldn't give alms to Diana or all of the other gods. They were considered atheists. Isn't that interesting? Because there is only one who's worthy. And as our culture, and you know what? Something really great and something really destructive happened when after much persecution, you know, the, the saints that came to the Council of Nicaea with Constantine, um, those were people who were marred and, and battered and bruised and disfigured. Those were people who paid the price to help, to help write that creed that we quote, I believe in God the Father, creator of heaven and earth. You know, the Apostles' Creed. It was a beautiful and wonderful thing that Rome stopped persecuting Christians. The unfortunate thing is that it became in vogue to be a Christian. So every single person, along with all of their pagan god baggage, jumped into the Christian church. And we have much of the same in our culture today. where we have Jesus plus. And it can take any kind of form. And if we don't know the word, it says, test all things, prove all things, discern all things. It says, know them by their fruits. You know, we are called to be ambassadors of the truth. And I'm not talking about some ethereal, weird metaphysical truth that we have yet to see. I'm talking about Jesus's, Jesus Christ's revelation through Scripture. That He made plain. There's no extra thing coming out. He made it plain for us to see. Amen? And we have to be stewards of that truth to the world. Because what is salt useful if it's lost its saltiness? You know, and I'm being a little harsh today, but... We're just holding up the mirror. I'm included in that. It's the last sermon of 2023. We'll be more gracious next week. There is no Jesus plus. There is no Jesus plus New Age mysticism. There is no Jesus plus things that we throw in the mix. There is no Jesus plus an obligatory, obligatory following of the Torah or horoscopes. We add so much garbage to the gospel and what it does, it creates something different that isn't the gospel. If there are nine Jesuses in the room, that means eight are wrong. And you just have to understand that as we go forward. If you're not going to Scripture for your revelation of Christ, you're going to the wrong place. And let me just say it again. Just because you have a YouTube channel doesn't mean you're a prophet. The Bible talks about how we will have itching ears and we'll become lovers of ourselves. The prophets, the people in the days of Jeremiah, the, as Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, was warning people to repent and turn to God because Babylon was coming. He said, just give up. You need to honor God. Repent and turn to God. The people said, lie to us. We don't want to hear the truth. Lie to us. 
And I'm telling you, if you're deceived, the key marker of deception is you don't know it. So what's your standard? Some YouTube video? What's your authority? A podcast? On Christ alone, my hope is found. All other ground is sinking sand. Listen, all other ground is sinking sand. As we walk into this new year, if we are basing our standard of truth or the way we see the world on anything other than the Word of God, you are being deceived. It says that judgment begins in the house of the Lord. And if we can't call out the goofiness, who is going to? If we aren't going to keep ourselves accountable, who is going to? There is no other God before me. There is no Jesus plus. If you want to have Disney plus, go for it. There's no G- boo. There's no Jesus plus. Can I get an amen? And here's the deal. Second point, we need to resolve to decide ahead of time. Every single one of my points was mentioned either in the announcement video or by Paul or by Pastor Steve in the baby dedication. Daniel did not decide to honor God for the first time in this moment. And if you think you are going to get to the fork of decision someday in the future and going to make the right decision spontaneously, you are wrong. And listen, it could happen. Probably not. And I, I'm speaking to myself. I'm speaking to myself. Firm foundations are built on daily decisions. And a knowledge of the word is built on a daily devotion. Not a podcast. And that's the thing. We, we say we're in relationship, we're in discipleship, I'm connected with the body of Christ, but it's like, we'll just take a YouTube video over talking to someone in our small group. Like, I got this thing going on in my life. I'll just watch a YouTube video. Figure it out. Good. Continue to live your private life. Continue to live your life unaccountable. Because who knows what's going on in your life? Because that YouTube person does not know what's going on in your life. That person on Facebook does not know how to support you in your darkest hour. You need the body of Christ and real people who are really involved in your life to come alongside of you and help carry your burdens, help strengthen you, help challenge you, laugh with you, cry with you. We need the body of Christ. And the, the wonderful thing about our culture is that we have an emphasis on, you know, protecting our God-given rights. The, the negative thing is that it's all about me. It's all about me and mine. Me, myself, and I. We have an individualism to the point of a sickness. And it was many years ago I read this amazing book. It was called The Narcissism Epidemic. And the most contemporary reference in that book was 2009. It's a long time ago, relatively speaking. We are swimming in it, folks, like fish in water. You know, and that's, again, it's a little harsh. We're not usually this harsh here. Um, I'm not usually this harsh. I'm an encourager, really. Um, (laughs) Circumstances, listen, are always going to come up. You have to decide ahead of time. There is always, 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 always going to be an excuse. Always. That's why if you don't decide ahead of time, you're not going to decide at all. 
decide for your fast today. You know, if you're going to fast, if you're going to engage in that at whatever level, whatever level you feel called or comfortable, it's like, decide today. If you're going to budget, if you're going to save money, if you're going to do anything, decide now rather than later. Because odds are, later we won't. Matthew 7, verse 25. Matthew 7. Matthew chapter 7. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, these circumstances, they just always keep on coming. It's weird. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and slammed against that house, and yet it did not fall, for it had been founded on the rock. Go to the next verse. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will not ever encounter bad circumstances, and it will be fine. And you'll decide in the moment to shore up your foundation. They will be a foolish man who built his house on sand. Huh. The same set of circumstances. It's weird. It's like it happens to all of us. The rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and slammed against that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. Faith and devotion are seeds sown. And Galatians chapter 6 says, if we will sow to the Spirit, we will reap life. But if we sow to the flesh, we will reap death and corruption. It's our choice. What are you sowing? What kind of garden are you growing? Proverbs chapter 4, it's not up there, but it says, guard your heart above all else because everything you do flows out of that place. Everything. Everything. When, I, when my, uh, my son Ezra was young, I came in, I was helping him get his jammies on, getting ready for bed. He goes, Dad, I know everything about sharks. Everything. Just like that. I was like, wow, that's a lot. It's like sharks. Spontaneous. So if you need a shark expert, my son, Ezra, knows everything about sharks. Um, that was years and years ago. Um, how do you navigate big decisions? How do you navigate these things that are crippling huge decisions? Let me give you a hint. You already did. Because every single little decision leading up to that thing will decide how you are going to react in that moment. If you manage the small decisions, the big decisions won't even be a thing. David killed bears. David killed lions. David defended his sheep while he was strumming on his harp. And all of a sudden, this big uncircumcised Philistine is standing, cursing against God's armies. You know, David says like two things about Goliath, but he says like nine things about who God is. If you decide ahead of time, it's not going to be a big deal. Last thing. Did I miss anything? Here's the thing. I did. Why is it important to decide ahead of, ahead of time? Because there are always going to be substitutes. Every Isaac has an Ishmael. Every promise has a preliminary answer. Every, <laughs> I, I, you know, Adam named all the, all the animals, and then God saw that there was no suit, suit, uh, suitable helper for him, and then he made Eve. I heard someone say one time, before Adam found Eve, he found a monkey. It's like, I don't think that's biblical, but it's kind of funny. Um, it's like, don't. Don't settle. Don't settle for substitutes. Beware of people or groups that claim to have the hidden, hidden hook. 
be wary. Be very cautious. And I wouldn't even say be cautious. Run from people that say they have the, the secret truth that's being withheld from you. Beware of people that draw you away from what Christ accomplished on the cross. Beware of people that have the secret sauce. You just have to listen to what they say. You just have to watch their videos. Did God really say that you would die? You're not going to die. It's like, so you have the hidden, you have the secret sauce, serpent? You'll know the truth when you eat the fruit. Problem is, you'll also die. Anyways, there's always going to be excuses, so you have to decide ahead of time. That's the other thing. It's like, so what? Adam and Eve, they bit the fruit, and now they know. Now they know the truth. Do you realize that? They knew. They got what, they got what the serpent promised. Do you realize that? Adam and Eve got the hidden knowledge. And they suddenly realized they were naked, they were ashamed, and now they were doomed to die without a redemptive answer. They got the hidden truth. And if we search for hidden truth and don't pursue Jesus, who is the truth, you might find the hidden truth someday. You might. It might come out. But the problem is, there is no redemptive end to that truth. There is no solution because it's an antichrist truth. Because it's the opposite and substitute of real truth. Guard your heart. Third thing, resolve to obtain a heavenly reward. Resolve to obtain a heavenly reward. What happened here? Daniel and his three friends resolved not to defile themselves. They said, no way. I'll go on a 10-day fast eating broccoli. Forget it. Rutabaga. Whatever it takes. I'll suffer for Jesus. I mean, rutabaga is okay. But look what it says. To those four young men, God gave. They gave up the king's choicest morsels, and yet God has now given them knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning, and God gave Daniel the understanding for visions and dreams. Resolve to serve God alone. You know what Daniel's name means? God is my judge. And that's not like the way our culture says it, like, can't judge me, man. God's going to judge me. Like, no. What I mean to say is all of us will stand accountable, and God is our judge. You're not going to have your anything other than you and God at that judgment seat. And what did you do with Christ will determine if you will enter his rest forever or depart from him because he never knew you. And then what you built with on this earth will determine your reward, whether it was wood, hay, and stubble and worth nothing, or if it was gold, silver, and precious stones and you gained an inheritance to be enjoyed forever with him. It matters. It matters. Who are you aiming to please? Let's close with this. Hebrews 11.6 
God is a rewarder. It says, without faith it's impossible to please Him. For he who comes to God must believe that He is and that He is a rewarder of those who earnestly seek Him. Matthew 16, 26 gives us a great picture. It says, for what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? You know what's interesting? This is not a negative statement. This is not even talking about sin. This is not talking about wickedness. This is a neutral statement that you could gain the whole world. But if you lose your soul, what does it afford you? It's not even the bad stuff. What are, who are we aiming to please? Who are we living to please? Are we, you can skip 1 Corinthians, but are we running this race to win for a little wreath on our head like the Romans did, like the Greeks did? Are you running this life for a crown of what we can gain today or in this life? Or are we running a race for a prize that will be given to us by God himself? The words, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful with little, and now I give you much. Listen, go to verse 20. In every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king, Nebuchadnezzar, this wicked king, questioned them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom. It pays not to defile yourself. Much later in Scripture, it, the, the whole book of Daniel is story after story. I mean, the lion's den, the fiery furnace, the, the giant idol that people would bow down to worship. It's like story after story about how these men stayed faithful and they said, nothing will keep me from worshiping God. You, you, I'm not supposed to worship God. Let me just open my window so everybody can see me worshiping God. Because your God, every other God, is an idol who cannot see, who cannot hear, who has no power to save, who does not have an outstretched arm like the God of Israel. So if we have Jesus plus, we'll lose it. Put the Lord first. And decide ahead of time how you will live. Because he's a rewarder of those who earnestly seek him. Are we tracking today? Nothing worth it, Sam, Olivia, is going to be easy. But God pays dividends to those who don't defile themselves. Who those, for those who seek Him and honor Him alone. Amen? Let's, let's stand and pray. You know, there will be people up here that would love to pray with you. I'd love to pray with you. Um, we have Ralph and Star, and maybe Pastor Steve and Joan will be up here too. If you would like prayer, maybe, maybe Jesus isn't Lord. Or maybe you've been living a life of Jesus plus, and you need to repent. Because Jesus plus something is no Jesus at all. He doesn't mix and that's kind of a hard word but it is the truth because he is the truth he's the way the truth and the life and no one comes to the father except through him so let's pray heavenly father lord thank you that you are bread from heaven
Lord, that you chose to reveal yourself as a humble child and then as a crucified Savior. And you will come again as a reigning king. But when you came to seek and save, you revealed yourself as a crucified Savior, as broken bread for the nations. Lord, thank you that you were broken, that we could be made whole. That you were pierced and poured out your blood, that we could be washed and forgiven. Lord, thank you that while we were yet sinners, while we were in darkness, you loved us by giving yourself for us. You shined in our darkness. While we couldn't tell our right hand from our left, you opened our eyes to your truth. Father, thank you that even way back in the garden, you promised that a Savior would come that would crush the head of the serpent. Lord, thank you that there is no power in Babylon when we resolve to serve you and you alone. Lord, I pray that you would help us to seek you first, to honor you and to decide ahead of time and know that you're a rewarder and we can trust you. Help us when the circumstances come and help us not to take an excuse but to turn to you. In Jesus' name, everyone said amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week.